Good afternoon and welcome back. I hope the conversations that you had within the policy discussions this morning and over lunch have stimulated your thinking and encouraging uh, further exchanges. We now move to Plenary 3 and we'll continue to hear uh, presentations covering the three strands of the summit. Can I ask Basma El Husseini to present cultural policy in places of change? Basma co-founded the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture and is the current managing director of Cultural Resource in Egypt, an organisation aimed at supporting young artists and writers. Presiding officer, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. It's a little strange, the feeling I have for being here, to allude to what uh, Simon Holt said yesterday. It looks like I am on the planet of good countries. And um, last night I was thinking about the ranking of some, some of the countries in my region in the Good Countries Index and found it rather a scary thought. But I'm not here to talk about the differences between our worlds, and there are huge differences. I'm here to talk about cultural policy. Or rather to share with you some of the dilemmas people like me have around this topic in the hope that maybe, as I share these ideas, that things will get clearer in my head, or maybe some of you would propose solutions that we did not think of, or that you will find in what I say one or two ideas that might be useful in your own contexts. The term cultural policy is now widely known in the Arab region, but back in 2009, when we started the first program in the Arab region to survey cultural policies in Arab countries, the situation was different. The term was rarely used and it was not easy to find researchers or scholars in this field. At that time, there were no official cultural policy documents in any Arab country. In 2009, we surveyed cultural policy, de facto cultural policies, in eight Arab countries and published this research in English and in Arabic. Then we held the first regional conference on cultural policy in the Arab region in Beirut in 2010, and after that, we formed and supported small groups of cultural operators, artists, and writers in different Arab countries uh, to analyze the de facto cultural policies and propose improvements. We also encourage these groups to invite cultural policy officials uh, to this uh, process and to seek official support. This program was supposed to be uh, a, a productive effort and to lead to positive uh, developments and changes within two to four years. But then, in early 2011, waves of massive protests swept across five countries in the Arab region, removing the heads of state and causing repercussions across the rest of the region. A lot has been said about the causes of these uprisings. And many international political analysts occupy themselves writing about their consequences. Today, sadly, these waves have either been suppressed by forces that belong to the old regimes or have been transformed into violent armed conflicts by regional and international powers causing shocking destruction and death tolls. It's not, impossible in my, it's not possible, in my opinion, to think and talk about cultural policy without considering the political contexts that encompass them. So please allow me to take a few moments to reflect on the political situation in some of the Arab countries and in particular in Egypt. As with complicated and violent political situations in many parts of the world, there are many readings of reality. It's almost sometimes like a Rashomon. In Egypt, you could find some people who would argue that what we have now in the country is a democratic regime headed by a democratically elected president. Subscribers to this argument would usually go on to explain that toppling the other democratically elected president who belonged to the Muslim Brotherhood and the following massacres, arrests, and bizarre death sentences was, in fact, inevitable and necessary to avoid the horrible, oppressive, and theocratic rule of the Muslim Brotherhood. 
my reading of the situation in Egypt is different. I will not elaborate on this further since this is a public session and that's also broadcast on the internet. The present moment in Egypt is a very difficult one. The economy is very weak with a huge internal debt and a rising budget deficit. The political horizon is gloomy, social tension is on the rise, human rights abuses are reaching unprecedented levels. Just uh, yesterday, uh, the two um, representatives of Human Rights Watch were detained at Cairo airport for 12 hours on arrival and deported out of the country. And for us working in arts and culture, the freedoms of expression and association are challenged with more restrictions every day. Having said all this, I must hasten to say that my personal view is that the story of the Egyptian revolution that started in 2011 is far from complete and that there are many more chapters yet to be written. As many of you know, especially those who lived in fast-changing political environments, and I see some people, maybe, um, cultural policy becomes dependent on political developments in a way that cannot be avoided. In fact, among the many power battles between the old regime in Egypt and the Muslim Brotherhood, the one that marked the fall of the Muslim Brotherhood is the one around the position of the Minister of Culture. It was also the, the one that was easiest for the old regime to win, simply because of the fact that the majority of artists and writers and cultural practitioners were strongly opposed to the Muslim Brotherhood. I can give more details about the political situation in Egypt, but it's perhaps too much talk about politics. Now it's time to talk about, again, cultural policy. How does one think and talk about cultural policy in such a turbulent and hostile environment? How can we as practitioners cater for the needs of our societies to express themselves creatively and to enjoy the moral and emotional spaciousness that the arts and culture offer? I don't really have a clear answer to this question. In lieu of an answer, please allow me to share with you three questions that are boiling in my head. My first question is about government structures and their effectiveness. In a state of political instability, such as the one that followed the 2011 uprisings in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Syria, and Yemen, it's often the case that there are frequent changes of, ministries of culture, ministers of culture and senior culture officials. The positive side of these changes is that they can shake off the long-standing practices that are based on corruption, favoritism, and oppression of freedom of expression. The negative side is that it becomes very difficult, even almost impossible, to get any government structure to commit to any plan or action on the medium or long term. Another effect of this state of instability is that ministers and senior officials feel vulnerable and not empowered enough to take decisions. This applies to both very small decisions, such as using public venues for one event, and big decisions like funding culture, independent cultural projects. And furthermore, in situations like the one in Syria, the mandate of the ministry itself is ambiguous. What about more than one third of the population who are displaced outside and inside the country? What about the parts of the country that are controlled by armed fanatic groups that are hostile to any artistic activities? For the past three years, the UN estimated number of nine million displaced Syrians have been living without any kind of cultural activity of service or service. Similar questions arise in the cases of Palestine, Libya, and Iraq. Although the problems faced by each country are very different. In such cases, ministries of culture and their policies lose much of their credibility. It is difficult to talk about a national cultural institutional institution or a national cultural policy when the world, world national itself is being contested. So my question is, to conclude this question, can we talk about cultural policy without effective and credible public institutions? My second question is about the value of culture. At times of instability and violent conflict, culture gets pushed down further, gets pushed down further the list of priorities, even more so than usual. 
In terms of the local and international media, the news are dominated by the clashes and the killings, and the art pages shrink every day. No one is interested to know, for example, that there is a monthly popular festival that has been held in public spaces in Egypt since April 2011, attended by hundreds of thousands of people, and that it is totally organized and funded by private citizens. The festival that you have been seeing pictures of, most of these pictures anyway. Some of them, this, the, one, the past one is in Tunisia, but the, the ones with the big crowds are all in, in Cairo. With regard to public funding, culture is the first victim to budget cuts that need to be imposed because of the flight of capital outside the country, the cancellation of tourism contracts, and other economic problems that contribute to increasing the uh, budget deficit. When the budget of the Ministry of Culture is cut, the salaries of the employees remain untouched. So the negative impact is all on the program budget, which means fewer and poorer cultural activities and services. On the other hand, at the same time, paradoxically, it is reassuring to note that the general appreciation of culture in the five countries that have started some sort of political change process has remarkably improved. The visible increase in popular demand on cultural activity is a strong statement against conservative views that artistic activities are immoral or, at best, wasteful. But how do we get this change in appreciating the value of culture to be reflected in the media and in public budgets? How do we get the society in general to recognize that this change, this change has happened? Second question. My third question is around the role of the civil society. And I come from a civil society background, so I'm not neutral, I'm biased. But, well, here you go. Can the civil society play a leading role in defending the position of culture and enhancing the recognition of its value, both in the society at large and in the severe competition over the diminishing financial resources? Can the civil society provide alternatives and substitutes to the almost paralyzed ministries of culture? The cultural civil society in the Arab region, also termed the independent cultural sector, most widely uh, used, more widely used this term, is small in size. It's not a very big sector. And it depends on international donors for almost all of its funding, or 90% of its funding. There is no accurate source of information on the number of cultural NGOs in the region. My rough estimate from experience is that there are around at least 100 effective cultural organizations in Egypt and around 50 in Tunisia. These are the two countries with the highest concentration of cultural organizations. However, it is this small sector that has been most active and responsive to the needs of Arab societies since the 2011 uprisings, producing plays, films, festivals, exhibitions, publications that reflect on the past very eventful last uh, three years. In my opinion, for this sector to fill the many gaps left by the governmental sector, at least for a transitional period until things are clearer, and to possibly play a major role in cultural policy formation on the long term, there is a very important prerequisite to organize. The sector has to organize itself in a way that makes it possible for other players to recognize it and interact with it. And at the same time, this organization has to truly reflect the many differences among civil society organizations. Organizing the sector, sector is no easy task, especially within the existing legal and political restrictions. In many countries, registering an NGO is almost impossible, like in Algeria, and of course in Syria all the time. Uh, in Egypt now, there are many, many obstacles put in the way of registering an NGO. But it is this organization is a crucial task. How do we go about it? Are there any lessons that we can learn from other experiences elsewhere? This is my third and last question. To conclude, I don't think we have the luxury of waiting until the political battles have been settled and the ministries of culture get stabilized. In fact, it would be wrong to do so because the cultural civil society is itself part of these battles 
and it can play a, an important role on the side of those fighting for freedom. This does not necessarily mean that artists should be expressing political views in their work all the time or at all. In societies where the vast majority of people have had no experience such as attending a theater performance or a music concert, the this, this simple act of making art and exchanging it is a political act because it challenges the very way the society has been unjustly organized and it encourages individuals and communities to question the long-standing norms and traditions. As the poet Mahmoud Darwish beautifully puts it, against barbarity, poetry can resist only by confirming its attachment to human fragility, like a blade of grass growing on a wall while armies march by. Thank you. Thank you, Vesma. We are now going to hear from the San Paolo Director of Brazilian Arts Funding Agency, SESC. Danilo Santos de Miranda will talk about the agency's unique private public funding model. And we have translation from the floor. <clears throat> the presenting officer, my dear friends, I always speak in Portuguese because it's easier for me and I can explain better my ideas. So I am helping by uh, Liliana, which is from, who is from the British Council, to help me here voluntarily. Ok? <clears throat> Muito bem. Vou falar em português. Espero que alguns aí, pelo menos, possam entender-me. E a Liliana, que vai ao meu lado, vai me ajudar uh, com a tradução. Em primeiro lugar, eu gostaria de cumprimentar a todos e agradecer essa extraordinária oportunidade de estar aqui falando para vocês eh, para eh, discutir a questão do financiamento e do funcionamento da nossa instituição. Agradeço especialmente ao amigo Jonathan Mills que me fez esse convite. Vamos lá. So, good afternoon. First of all, I want to greet everyone and thanks for the opportunity for being here and exposing a little bit of the funding model that SESC plays in Brazil. I want to thank you personally, Jonathan Mills, for, being, uh, for the invitation. Okay. Uh, I'd like to, eu diria que eu sou, estou uh, comunicando essa, essas questões uh, como um gestor responsável por essa instituição é, portanto, tem um ponto de vista de alguém que está na administração dessa organização há muito tempo e no Brasil, portanto, com as características típicas do Brasil. E eu falarei primeiro um pouco da situação do Brasil e depois da minha instituição. So, uh, as the director of SESC, uh, I want to give you a context about Brazil and where we stand at the moment in terms of economic and also social uh, profile, so I can actually go uh, to Sesc in order to explain what my institution um, does in Brazil. Eu sei que falar do Brasil depois da hecatombe, do desastre da Copa do Mundo, é sempre um desafio muito grande. I know that after the World Cup disaster, it's a challenge for me to be here and explaining about Brazil's situation to you. Mas, de qualquer forma, é um prazer poder falar um pouco das questões referentes ao nosso país, especialmente dos seus lados positivos e negativos, para poder entender a realidade brasileira. Mas é importante que eu explique para você quais são os problemas que o Brasil está enfrentando agora, especialmente o especially lado negativo, o lado de baixo das coisas e o lado positivo das coisas também. É importante eh, entender o Brasil como o chamado país emergente, um dos membros do chamado BRICS, esse grupo de países emergentes no mundo atualmente. É importante to remember that uh, it's an emerging economy, so we are included in the BRICS countries. 
É, grandes perspectivas o nosso país tem, sem dúvida alguma, riquezas naturais, biodiversidade, crescimento social e econômico, população multicultural. So, of course, we are uh, a rich country in terms of our biodiversity, I'm sorry, for the nature, the nature landscape we have, for the economic growth we are facing, so we have a good perspective in terms of Brazil's future. Devemos dizer que nos últimos anos houve um crescimento da população que participa do mercado e que tem, portanto, possibilidades de alguma forma estar presente numa sociedade mais desenvolvida. So we have also had a significant increase in terms of population access to the um, to the market, and not only cultural market that we'll tell later, but in terms of people consuming uh, goods and services in Brazil. Por outro lado, nós temos uma sociedade com profundas diferenças sociais e econômicas. Uh, on the other hand, we have big inequalities in terms of social income and massive difference in, the, in our society. Uma diferença enorme entre a pobreza e a riqueza existente no nosso país e que, portanto, revela uma situação absolutamente desequilibrada e que necessita de políticas públicas para poder corrigir. We have a massive gap between the wealthy and poverty, uh, which makes the need, the urgent need to have public policies in place to address and to tackle those issues. Temos um enorme desequilíbrio territorial, uma região em que a riqueza é maior do que em outras regiões. We have also uh, territory inequalities. So we have uh, uh, poor regions and on the other hand very wealthy regions uh, inside the same country. Temos uma questão grave nas cidades da chamada violência urbana proveniente do narcotráfico e das diferenças sociais. We have uh, issues with urban violence um, because of the narco-traffic and that causes uh, lots of issues uh, around urban violence. Temos uma questão grave, especialmente na cidade de São Paulo, ligado à questão da mobilidade, do transporte público, da preferência pelo transporte individual. O grande inimigo da cidade de São Paulo hoje, das grandes cidades, é o transporte individual. So we have issues around mobility. That's the, one of the major issues we face, especially in São Paulo, uh, because people usually take individual transport, and this is becoming a major problem for, for us. Temos problemas, portanto, na saúde, na educação e também na cultura. We have also problems in health, education, and in culture as well. Com relação à educação, eu diria que é a grande questão nacional, juntamente com a chamada infraestrutura necessária para prover serviços para toda a população. I would say education is a national issue alongside the infrastructure problems that we are facing. Nós temos grandes esforços por parte do governo, por parte da sociedade, por parte das empresas, por parte dos trabalhadores e NGO e, e organizações não governamentais. We have big efforts being done by the government, by the civil society, by enterprises, by the population and by the third sector, the NGOs. Com relação a esse esforço da sociedade, eu apontaria o SESC como uma das entidades que desde muitos anos vem fazendo um excelente trabalho no país em prol da cultura e em prol da inclusão social. Uh, as part of this effort, SESC, uh, which stands for Social Service of Commerce, uh, plays a key role on that from the society perspective, as it contributes to social inclusion and culture and education. Uh, o SESC surge nos anos 40 do século passado, no pós-guerra, depois da ditadura Vargas, num momento muito especial, quando o Brasil inicia um processo de industrialização, de urbanização intensa. Uh, SESC uh, was born in the 1940, um, after post-war, uh, after the dictatorship of uh, Getúlio Vargas, and basically at that, at that time Brazil was facing a massive growth on industrialization and uh, urban movement as well. Algumas cidades cresceram exponencialmente. São Paulo, por exemplo, nesse período do pós-guerra, 
era uma cidade de cerca de 3 milhões de habitantes. Hoje, a cidade conta com 12 milhões de habitantes, sem contar em volta, do, em volta de São Paulo, mais outras cidades que compõem uma região metropolitana de 20 milhões, praticamente. So, some cities grow very, very fast, and São Paulo was one of them. At that time, in the 40s, uh, we had 3 million people uh, in the capital, in the city of São Paulo, where we have actually today 12 million. Uh, if you count a greater São Paulo, we have around 20 million people living. Esta população proveniente, sobretudo, do campo, da zona rural, vem com problemas gravíssimos de analfabetismo e despreparo completo para o mercado de trabalho e para disputar uma posição nas empresas. So this rural uh, population that comes to the city, they come with uh, major issues. Basically, uh, uh, basically, the illiteracy rates are very, very massive, and also the lack of preparation to enter the professional market, the job market. No mesmo instante, a urbanização se dá de uma maneira caótica, desorganizada, criando situações muito sérias como as favelas e as periferias das grandes cidades. E, ao mesmo tempo, a urbanização comes vem de uma chaotic way, uh, uh, provoking uh, the, 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 the gap between the periphery and the city and also the favelas, which are uh, the slums, uh, we call favelas in Brazil. Nesse momento, nos anos 40, nesse pós-guerra, a elite empresarial procura se envolver com o governo no sentido de procurar soluções que possam colaborar com o crescimento e o desenvolvimento do país. At that time, after the after post-war, um, the enterprises, the, the elite of the enterprise, they come with the government, they're trying to uh, find ways to tackle these issues around rapid uh, urbanization. So, um, the, yeah, they are actually talking to the government at that time to find those potential solutions. E propõe ao governo a criação de alguns organismos que possam dar conta e responder a essas necessidades que surgem com o crescimento e o desenvolvimento do país. So they propose the creation of, of a institution or various institutions who could actually tackle these issues and respond to the needs of this rapid movement. Nós estamos falando, portanto, de uma população que vem do campo, analfabeta, que constitui mais de 75% da população brasileira naquele período. We are talking about rural population uh, with uh, high rates of illiteracy uh, coming, and at that stage it was more than 65% of the population on that. Então nós temos duas influências para, de alguma forma, procurar soluções. Uma influência de caráter economicista que procura buscar recursos para prover e providenciar essas instituições, essa transformação. So we have two influences on that, on that uh, uh, movement. The first one is the economic perspective, that we will look after, uh, look for with, uh, actually resources that will be, have to be incorporated in order for those institutions to act. E uma influência de caráter humanista no sentido de colaborar para que essas pessoas se tornem capazes de participar do processo de crescimento e desenvolvimento do país. And the other influence is a human influence in order to instigate and to engage people uh, to find those solutions together and to be engaged in the development of this new concept, of this new system. As, as elites empresariais organizadas nas suas instituições propõem, portanto, uma taxa retirada da folha de pagamento das suas empresas sem que seja retirado do trabalhador, mas sim que seja acrescido pelo pagador, pelo empresário, de modo a poder colaborar para a criação de um fundo que possa desenvolver essas instituições. So those enterprises, they proposed at that time that 1.5% of the payroll coming from the employees of those, uh, of those um, enterprises 
is added to a pot of money, to a fund that will help those uh, institutions to be born Isso and operating. Foi criado em 1946 e que existe até hoje, inclusive com o suporte da Constituição Federal Brasileira, e desenvolve um vasto, grande programa de bem-estar social. So this, was, uh, this law is backdated in 1946, and today is part of the national constitution, which allows them to keep the work doing. And up to now, it's 1.5% of the payroll, so the funding mechanism is still the same and very successful. Esta contribuição é obrigada, porque está na lei, posteriormente criada para esta finalidade, portanto, tem um caráter também público. So this contribution is a compulsory one and is supported by a law that was um, created to make sure that this, this contribution would still exist nowadays. So therefore, uh, this fund has a, a public uh, service, public use. Exatamente. E esse, esse serviço, essa contribuição obrigatória por lei, ela prover inúmeros serviços voltados para saúde, educação, assistência, cultura, esporte, recreação e lazer. So this compulsory uh, tax supports uh, the fund that um, Saski provides health, education, sports, culture, dentistry, nutrition and recreation services for the enterprises but also to the general public in São Paulo. Podemos ver algumas imagens que refletem essa ação uh, no Sesc de São Paulo. We can see some images. I o think já, they were they were showed. Yeah. yeah. That uh, gives you an idea what Sesc operation looks like. É importante ressaltar dois aspectos dessa contribuição e dessa organização. Primeiro, ela é regionalizada. Cada estado funciona de acordo com as suas necessidades no país. Two very important aspects I need to point out. First one is we have regional administration, so every state has autonomy to decide on how they want to operate. Mas, por outro lado, é importante ressaltar também que existe um controle público do Tribunal de Contas do, do país para saber o uso adequado desses recursos. And it's important that we are audited and controlled by the government, by the public power, uh, just because they want to check how and when and how we are spending the money. Do ponto de vista histórico, é importante ressaltar que o SESC começou nos anos 40 numa perspectiva assistencialista e paternalista. It's important also to remember you that in 1940, when SESC was created, we had a more assistentialist role, and in a way, a paternalism role as well. No decorrer dos anos, a perspectiva se tornou cada vez mais educativa e desenvolvimentista, promotora da autonomia das pessoas. Over the years, it became more focused on the development of people's autonomy and on development of education as a, as a resource, as an important resource for citizenship. Hoje podemos dizer que o SESC tem como centro da sua atividade a promoção cultural. A cultura, no conceito mais ampliado, é que desenvolve as, as atividades do SESC. Today we can say that heart sits, the uh, culture sits at the heart of SESC does in a wider spectrum when, when we say culture. In terms of arts, sport, convivence, meio ambiente and other perspectives that are part of the human being. Culture in a way of including arts, sports, social well-being and other, uh, other uh, meanings as well. And the reason for this is a ação transversal da cultura. A cultura está presente em todas as manifestações humanas. And the reason why we take cultures in a wider way is because we have a transversal action uh, in our, in our uh, operations, in our work. So we take culture in a transversal way. Okay. 
Nós podemos dizer que os programas voltados para a cultura é, contemplam ações nacionais e internacionais e, ao mesmo tempo, programas de formação voltados, portanto, para a preparação de criadores para o futuro. It's important to say that our program uh, is a national, international, and also very focused on capacity building, preparing people for, for the culture, preparing people for the arts. So we have a massive a scope of work in SESCI. Nós temos uma ação em todo o país. We have an action across the country in all Brazil. No, Brasil, no estado de São Paulo, são 35 sedes no estado. In São Paulo, we have 35 units across the Paulo. Rede de teatros, a network of a huge network of theaters, centros culturais esportivos, sports cultural centers, e toda a rede de serviços de saúde, nutrição, alimentação, terceira idade, criança, and a etc. network for health, dentistry, uh, elderly people uh, uh, services. Uma grande conexão internacional em termos de grupos que vêm para o Brasil e grupos do Brasil que vão para o exterior. We have a big international uh, connections, so we have lo loads of uh, theater companies, uh, artist companies performing Sesc, and also we uh, provide the support to take Brazilian uh, performers outside of Brazil. Uma conexão forte com os institutos de caráter internacional presentes no Brasil, como, por exemplo, o British Council. We have, of course, strong links with uh, the cultural organisms like the British Council that are present in, in Brazil. E temos, portanto, uma vinculação internacional muito presente, uma conexão muito forte, que para nós é muito importante que seja muito mais do que uma questão material, uma questão realmente de caráter cultural, que respeita a diversidade e que atue de maneira cada vez mais completa. E para nós, esses links internacionais são really, really important as they foster new links, they respect diversity, they respect culture in its broader way. Eu gostaria apenas de ressaltar que para nós a cultura no seu sentido mais profundo é a única forma realmente de fazer crescer, desenvolver um país efetivamente. Muito obrigado. I would like to emphasize that, in my point of view, culture is the only way, only way uh, on which countries can grow, can develop, and can be successful. Thank you. Many thanks, Daniel. May I ask Paul Carter now to present placemaking and storytelling. Paul is an accomplished artist. He is Professor of Design at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Paul. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> and thank you to distinguished delegates, my distinguished colleagues, and to the members of the public who have um, taken the time out to spend the afternoon here. Uh, it's an enormous privilege to be able to speak in this place of democratic decision making. It's a privilege, it's a great responsibility. Um, the resources that have gone into organizing this magnificent event um, would, I was doing it on uh, my mobile phone, translate into the purchase of something like 20,000 hectares of Amazonian jungle. Um, I'm working on um, a cultural development project in Peru. Uh, it's an attempt to try to bring together uh, traditional agricultural practices, <clears throat> traditional art practices, and to see what uh, can be made of these in the context of uh, a seemingly ubiquitous palm oil culture. So I preface this uh, remarks I want to make now with that observation. It's the full moon, it's a time for reflection. Um, it's also relevant to understand how arts and cultural production um, sits always within that larger reality of nature and the environment, and I will come back to that. But I was particularly touched by Robin Archer's concluding remark um, in her brilliant paper, where she made a comparison between cultural ecology and the rainforest, um, and it's a very good one. 
Because when I talk about placemaking, I'm not talking about a 19th century white male centralist and utilitarian notion of the grid. I'm thinking about what has happened as a consequence of displacement, what has happened as a consequence of the clear felling of cultures under imperialism. This is the context in which I would like to pick up on some of the remarks that we had yesterday and earlier today about urban culture. I come from the country and I'm well aware that the history of the city has frequently been the death of the country. Um, it's not the case that cities are sustainable because they sustain themselves. Generally speaking, they leach out the best stories from other places. So one of our responsibilities in understanding the new commerce of public space in the city is to remember that moon side, that dark side, the actual cost to cultures that do not wish to be urbanized. So I want to put before you a concrete situation where the role of culture is clear. And this is the situation of urban development, and in particular the planning of public space. And we will just worry about that phrase in a moment. And we have heard how important urban cultures are in promoting civility, intellectual, moral, and spiritual growth. But we all have in our countries, and we've heard this eloquently in the last two presentations, cities that lack identity, atmosphere, and emotional interest. Such cities may have good communications, high-rise icons, and even department stores. But they lack public space, they lack vision, they lack scale, and under the impact of rapid urbanization, they produce an astonishing isolation. Now, I do want to suggest that public space provides the body of social life, heart, lungs, and head. Indeed, I wouldn't even go further. When we hear about the challenges facing humanity, I often want to ask, on whose behalf do we presume to speak? Whose interests are we defending? And I come to the conclusion that ultimately we're defending the possibility of coexistence, of meeting and sociability. We are defending the world we have in common. So I also want to share with you the challenges of inclusive, socially equitable and sustainable placemaking. So my background is as a migrant, a voluntary migrant, if you like, somebody who made a decision, you could say an extended romantic weekend, to move from Europe to Australia many years ago. But it led me to reflect increasingly on the challenges of displacement, historically, of contemporary racism associated with the manipulation of transnational migration, the recognition of the impacts of cultural as well as physical genocide, and in particular to think about the relationship between all of these and the erasure of memory from the landscape. And I wrote a book called The Road to Botany Bay. And what that tried to do was to look at the poetic mechanisms which cultures of invasion use to create the landscapes they need to inhabit. And what that did was also show that if you look at the names and the stories that are told, you also have a mechanism for going back to start with different stories. Acts of memory can also be acts of amnesia. This led to a public art practice where I tried to translate these discoveries about the relationship between storytelling and the creation of sociability and living together into public art and public space design. Because as we were told yesterday, um, the nation state has very often been an instrument of imperialism. And this is the point that um, Professor Saski Assassin was making. So in other words, the simple assumption that one can associate public space with the emergence of the nation state is extremely suspect. I'm also suspicious of the model that perpetuates the nation state in relation to such quotations or phrases as exchange and bridges of understanding. Even cosmopolitan cultures live in states of tension. Culture is not a pastime. It's an essential mechanism of governance. In the city, it's the ambience, the shared symbols of association and translation, very hard to audit. Globally, it is the federal model, perhaps, that remains quite attractive. So it's very complex, this network of shared meanings, which hold us together and hold us apart. It's constantly being produced and reproduced. It is the work of cultural production. 
It's Vico, the 18th century philosopher's labor of memory, imagination, and invention, always stretched over the abyss of violence and strung with amity. And in fact, to be provocative, I am suspicious of culture. What has your culture ever done for us? My Noongar colleague asks in the context of a new civic square that we're designing in Perth. Culture is not necessarily a bearer of trust. In many countries, public space means the space of the colonizer. So, to make places where we can live together involves remembering, imagining, and inventing differently. It may also be the case that we do not want to live together. Um, I've just published a book called Meeting Place, which con constructs a dialogue between indigenous understandings of the role of meeting and Western, broadly European, philosophies of sociability. And my point there is that two very different traditions, two different philosophies of conviviality exist, uh, but we tend to forget uh, the indigenous one, in which we meet in order to part, in which we meet in order to be able to keep open the country that is our common care. It's not about an endless beehive-like collection in one place. What this means in terms of placemaking, over the abyss, if you like, is that we need to understand what the symbols are that we care to employ. It certainly means caring for what um, Saskia Sassen referred to as the urban code. It was a very nice expression. I like that. Spacing and timing are essential if we are to conserve the public domain. To plan otherwise is to abandon the rest of the world to death. I can see it in the Amazon. But the artist, the designer, the engineer, and the planner who all write code script the, the, the city in different languages. And currently, the goal of these codes is always, as we heard yesterday, simplicity. But the kinds of projects I work on, urban renewal, public space design, cross-cultural placemaking, respond to complex situations, functional, psychological, and social. And I use symbols, myths, stories, gestures drawn from history, science and belief to find convergences, coincidences. In this way, a co-appearance occurs as friends, but it doesn't depend on a tribal or kinship-based relation. Then I find people stop talking about identity and they begin identifying with a new shared reality. So this is what I've done and what I'm doing. And the challenge for you as delegates empowered to support cultural activity is to change our culture of planning into a culture of placemaking. It is not simply to find mechanisms to raise culture's political profile. It's to advocate for new tools of dialogue embedded in richer processes of placemaking. The situation I'm working towards is one where there is a triangulation between arts, sciences, and design. Currently, most governments allocate public monies to the arts. You can think of plenty of examples, both in the academic sector and also in the tourism sector. They also have significant scientific research and development budgets. And again, we can think of plenty of examples of how that operates. And finally, and perhaps most significantly, all governments, however short they are, apparently of money, invest heavily and enormously in infrastructure. But these three sectors of investment in the future never talk to one another. In the new model, planning would be an act of collaboration, a process where the incompleteness of the city is embedded in the process. And the result would be cities that were legible, generative, and hopeful. They would fulfill the potential of a city to be a cultural event. That is, to generate new stories, new literacies, new senses of place as projects of arrival, translation, and welcome, and therefore of a world of growing archipelago of such sustainable endeavors. And notice I use the word world, not globe. I'm interested in recovering the meaning of the world. The world has roundness, it has limits in its infinity, it accommodates darkness as well as night, it remembers those who've passed as well as those who are present, and above all, it reminds us that we are a water body. So that is, in essence, what I wanted to share with you this afternoon. 
And I'm a rather nervous string figure operator, but I thought it was important to be able to materialize the gesture. I'm working at the moment on a project in Perth, which is um, based on the commemoration of an early Aboriginal freedom fighter who suffered a hideous murder, but now through the uh, combined efforts of the Noongar people and the Premier of Western Australia, slightly surprisingly, um, has given his name to the new Civic Square. It's an immense responsibility for us to create a new body. And the dominant figure that we're using to understand the tension of this new place, this new opening um, in the herbs, is the string figure. This is the string figure. And the point about the string figure is that even as you begin to make it, it produces a triangulation. This is a triangulation I want to communicate to you between the arts, the sciences, and urban design. It's a new alliance that would allow us to think about the empowerment of creative activity through a reconnection to an understanding of such arcane topics as new materials and nanotechnology. It would also allow us to work to improve the design of infrastructure so that the city does indeed become what it could be, a great artwork, and above all, one that is responsive to the natural world on which it depends. And the key to the string figure, when it's applied to the urban environment, is it holds together because it holds apart. And therefore, I submit, it's a way of understanding unity that allows, permits, and indeed encourages biodiversity. Thank you. Paul, thank you very much. Our concluding presentation in this plenary is from Kent Larson. He is the director of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Media Labs Changing Places Group. And Kent will present on city science. Kent. Thank you. So it's great to be here in this um, fabulous city and experience the festival, and I'm uh, thrilled that one of the uh, themes that we're focusing on uh, is cities. Uh, and uh, thanks to Jonathan for inviting me and to, uh, for setting this agenda. I, I would like to start with my very brief history of cities, which um, often started with a settlement around a scarce resource like a well. And they were limited in size to how far someone in this case could could walk carrying a pot of water on their head. And you see uh, this pattern if you fly over Germany or India or any um, rural area, you see a series of villages that are a mile, mile and a half apart because that was the distance you could walk conveniently to the, to the fields. And if you look at medieval cities, I love maps. I collect lots of maps. You find that quite often they're about a mile in diameter. You can walk that in 20 minutes. There's something very fundamental about that dimension, and you can literally find hundreds and hundreds of these examples, not only in Europe, but in Latin America. And in Asia, you can see it here in Edinburgh, where, of course, you have your Royal Mile. Uh, and uh, so we've been, we've been exploring this notion of the neighborhood, this, this urban cell which is a compact community where people live and work and play and um, uh, engage generally in, in most things that are um, necessary for activities of daily living. Paris it consists of the 20 arrondissements. They're basically that pattern. What's great about Paris, and actually most other cities in Europe that evolved before the car, is you have a very even infrastructure of amenities. So every dot here is a cafe or a shop or a physician or a pharmacy. Okay, that's just the opposite of what they do in China. Well, they'll, they'll put the hospital district down in this quadrant. And uh, this, this creates a very walkable, livable city. Then we had technology, so streetcars that then would allow dispersed functions to be connected and trains. And then, of course, everything changed when the cars hit. And, uh, and we started to design for the needs of machines rather than people. And uh, in fact, in, in the city where I live in Boston, we took this really ugly cut 
through the center of this historic city. Fortunately, we've now taken it down. Um, uh, and uh, this is the kind of the model of urbanization that's being followed now all over the world. This is Los Angeles, low density, sprawl dependent on the private automobile. You have the same thing in China. It's a little higher density, but the same idea. Uh, we're building these uh, single-purpose ghettos. They may be high, very expensive condominiums, but they're, they're still a ghetto in that uh, they're not a community. Uh, that uh, is, is connected to other communities uh, without the car. Uh, this is uh, what you're finding all over the world. I took this video out the window of my taxi in Beijing last year on a really good day because that's green and yellow up there. There's no red. So the traffic was flowing nicely that day uh, by comparison. <laughs> this is Sao Paulo. You find the same thing. Okay. And then you... Uh, I spent a lot of time in Beijing recently. The pollution is extraordinary. A combination of coal and, ca and cars stalled in traffic. Uh, but it's so critical that we get the design of cities right, and we are not doing that uh, because 90% of population growth will take place in cities. Um, most of the innovation takes place in cities, but the world is not flat in that respect. The patents are filed where these green circles are on the coast of the US, Northern Europe, Korea, Japan, cities that have the qualities that support innovation. Uh, we think, uh, looking at the data, that there's a really interesting relationship to, to density, good things and bad things. So if you see that lower scale as population increases, millions of people, that uh, AIDS and crime goes up non-linearly, uh, along with patents and GDP, R&D investment, uh, energy efficiency, water efficiency, arts activity, they all go up together, good things and bad things. In fact, this is a study by a group in uh, Singapore, not surprisingly, looking at livability on the bottom, density going up the left. Singapore's the most livable high-density city by this analysis, but you can, have, you can do density well or you can do it poorly. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, density rela related to uh, energy, uh, uh, transportation energy. Houston's about as bad as it gets because it's a low-density city dependent on the automobile. Hong Kong's about as good as it gets because it's not dependent on the private automobile and it's high density. Uh, it, it's interesting to look at new developments. I was just in Dubai in the downtown area, which, by the way, is about a kilometer in diameter. It's very high density, but it's low, low diversity, low social diversity, mostly high-end condos for rich people. Uh, if you go to uh, Rio, to, uh, how do you say that? La Roquina? It's about a kilometer in diameter. High density, but low social diversity. Same as Dubai, just on the other end of the spectrum. You can find high density high social diversity, but low enterprise diversity. Where I work in Kendall Square, it's high job density, but low residential density. So there's, there, there, it's very complicated. So we've been asking this question, what enables innovative, entrepreneurial, high-performance cities? And we're exploring this formula. We haven't solved it yet. But that density plus diversity plus proximity if you get it right, equals innovation, quality of life, and sustainability. Also equals a lot of other things like equity. So we were working on this notion that if you can up the density generally in cities, social tie density, residential employment density, all the third places density, you add to that diversity, not just demographic diversity, but enterprise diversity, big companies, little companies, startups, research center, housing diversity for young people, old people, families, activity diversity, eating, socializing, et cetera, and then add urban interventions <clears throat> so you manage the problems that otherwise come with density and you proactively increase diversity, then you eat equal a high innovation potential. And then following that are all the eco things that just fall by the wayside as a byproduct. So start with people. That's our theory. So let me, I just want to go through what we're doing in these areas because we like to build things. 
Um, this is uh, our notion of what a city should be. It's really just a city of microcities that are connected by these red lines, which are trams maybe 25 to 30,000 people in each square kilometer. Maybe the cars are around the perimeter, but you don't need cars when you go into that. We decided to model this approach with Legos, of course. So we have uh, Lego units, it's a data unit. Okay, that smallest little brick up there, that could equal 300 customers if it's, uh, per day if that's a Starbucks. And then we can rapidly go through a design process. If you know the code where yellow is retail, black is housing, white is office, you can very easily see how these things go together. We took a new city, horribly designed city in China, Nansa. And these are one square kilometer neighborhoods. You can see the parties are very different. They use the same number of bricks, the same functions, but the experience and probably the economic performance and the cultural performance would be very different. It's very hard to know what that would be, though. So we're trying to understand that. We, we, we're, we're looking at mapping then experiences to these sort of pre-architecture designs. Uh, we just um, formed a partnership with Mori Builders that did Roppongi Hills, so I'm very interested in that. There are three layers to this building. There's this mobility layer at the street. That's where the Gucci's and the Prada's are and the cars. Then there's this upper level, this beautiful garden, footpath, terrace level. And then you have the functional layers, these office buildings, residential buildings that can just be extruded up. Nobody really cares. You don't really see them. That can just sort of parametrically tune the density. Uh, we're interested in um, mapping you know, great public spaces. This is from Seoul, Korea. One of my favorite projects where they took down their highway, put this beautiful stream, uh, very poetic, gets more and more natural as you get down towards the river. And uh, Manhattan, we did essentially the same thing, only we went up to the elevated train tracks for the High Line. New ways of, these are sort of super highways for pedestrians through the city and great experiences for people. So we can map all of these kind of things. Then we decided we needed a better decision support tool. Uh, and I very much like this from the movie Avatar because it is a platform where you visualize complex three-dimensional data in new ways to make decisions about how to kill people better. And, and so we thought maybe we can do the same thing with urban planning. So this is, uh, you, this is using a Lego bricks. We're studying Kendall Square, which is cited as one of the models for innovation districts. It's actually kind of dysfunctional. Everything in green is what we're adding because 3,000 people uh, live there and 40,000 people work there every day. So you have these inflows and outflows of people. It's very dead at night. So this is a, uh, a platform that we built with projectors where we can do what's called 3D projection mapping. This is the satellite view. We can then run all kinds of models. This is the easy stuff, solar radiation, wind flows. Uh, but we're looking at, I think, more interesting views into the city. This is where all the venture funding is by industry segments. So that reveals some interesting things. Uh, these are all the mobility modes, um, including the new shared bike systems that we have. This is Ira, who's sitting over there. He's tweeting hashtag CityScope. And so he's in the Media Lab building, so that lights up, and then his tweet is there. And so we can, we can use this as a real-time data visualizer. And it's very interesting that this is a proxy for the activities of young people. So the Media Lab building, which is up there on the top, and the uh, Artificial Intelligence Lab are brightly lit. The Sloan Business School is usually pretty dim. I don't know why. The, the, the uh, Cambridge Innovation Center with uh, more startups than anywhere else on the planet is always lit up. So nice proxy. We're, we're working on new tools. This was just a hack a student did one weekend to paint the model, just using, just using his hand. And um, so we're looking at new interfaces. I show that just for fun. Uh, we, you can look at land use. Yellow is housing. You see how little housing it is. The light blue is MIT buildings. The, the darker blue are the research labs. Um, we, we've built an, a number of these different tools. We had a um, group from outside of Brisbane building a new city came to us, said they have a walkable city. So we decided to model it with where uh, 
Red are the businesses, blue are the, house, are the houses. Uh, you can see the population and the number of jobs. You can get a walkability number. Uh, the green is more walkable, the red is less walkable. You can dynamically tune the density and, uh, and how far someone can walk. Here we're moving uh, jobs closer to houses and you see the walkability score goes up. So we're interested in these real-time tools that can give feedback to non-experts. We'd like to embody these tools with expert knowledge but allow them to be used by non-experts. So this was uh, the planning commission that was, I think we caused them to uh, reevaluate their zoning ordinance because it didn't meet their stated ex expectations. We, we tested it in a new district in Riyadh in a workshop that was kind of interesting. Uh, this is a tool that we built actually for use in our workshop, which is coming up next, where um, in this case, uh, IRA adjusts for one, one building the, the um, mix of uses and the, and the density and maps that to a building. Forget about the form. Form's not important here. This is all about function. And, and then he can very rapidly build a city, but he's building a city with data. So as, as you add these building elements, you know precisely what the, the, the number of residential units are, retail, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Ira and Caleb videotaped this last night after they had set it up. So we'll, we'll see it a little bit later. We're, we're, we're now working separately on modeling interactions. So in this case, these are two office buildings. You can see, you can think of them as force fields. So people move about them. They're attracted to residential and cafes and shops, and you can begin to see the interactions of people. And what's critical for innovation is to trigger interactions because some percentage of those interactions will be creative, which then leads to innovation. So if you, if you dial up the density, you have to then find alternatives to cars, otherwise you have traffic problems. So we're working on uh, uh, what we call mobility on demand, alternatives to the private automobile. So this is our vision of a mobility on demand system, that you have all of these shared use modes you use the right mode for the right trip at the right time. The most important one is up in the upper left, which is walkability. But then you have shared bikes, you have trams that connect each of these micro cities, you have electric uh, bikes, et, et cetera. All available with a single card or probably your mobile phone. This is a, a little three-wheel vehicle we're, we're working on right now that's shared use to be integrated into a bike sharing program. U ultimately, we think these will all be autonomous vehicles. They will come to you and, uh, and, and it, they may deliver packages autonomously at night for Amazon and, and, uh, and FedEx and the like. This is uh, a little city car that we designed a few years ago. The essence of this is that you get rid of the engine and the transmission, you put all the mechanicals into the wheels, you have robot wheels, so you have drive motor, steering, braking, suspension, all in each wheel that plugs in like a USB port, it's all drive by wire, you can go nose into the curb, the length of the vehicle is the width of the conventional car, the front door opens, you step directly out, you get three and a half of these to the space of one conventional car in a parallel parking situation. People thought this was a, just a crazy media lab idea, but we, we actually worked with Ford and GM and then a startup in Spain to commercialize this. This is on the streets of Vitoria in the Basque region. By the way, the yoke can pivot left or right so you can use it in Paris or London the same day. We presented this at the EU headquarters in, uh, in Brussels. That's Barossa who presented it as example of US European urban innovation, our happy sponsor. That's an old project. We're now, in that we finished it last year, um, we're now looking at this. That we think this is, this is the future. It's a combination of autonomy with vehicle sharing, with electrification, all tied together through new sensor networks. And if a car can park itself and charge itself in an out of the way place, uh, you can serve about five times as many people with a single car, uh, uh, sorry, about ten times as many people with a single car 
parking, you get a five to one ratio. So you have a 50 fold efficiency in land use for parking and you keep these vehicles in use more. So the value proposition is quite strong. Uh, where we um, are looking at new ways to collect data. Th these are people moving through um, San Francisco, or, or more accurately, mobile phones moving through San Francisco. So what we're doing is we're, we're uh, classifying them as members of a nightlife tribe and then mapping that back onto the city and then finding what else they have in common. They tend to buy the same shoes and buy the same cell phones and have the same diseases. And so we're using this kind of information to build uh, a model of autonomous shared use vehicles in the city. So here you see the vehicles communicating with each other. The purple areas are fixed infrastructure in the city that communicates with the vehicles that creates a very, what we think, low cost, scalable uh, shared vehicle autonomous vehicle system. And if you do that, you get rid of all traffic lights, no parking lots, no turn lanes, um, integrated with other modes. In other words, everything changes. You know, any city that's being designed now without taking this into account is, is not facing reality. This is just uh, that study that I'm now projected onto a, the three-dimensional model of Kendall Square. And by the way, some of the most innovative mayors, like the mayor of Hamburg, uh, has announced this. They plan to be car-free by 2034. I think what he means is private car-free, but uh, we're working with them. Eventually, we'll get to this, because it's really too dangerous for people to be behind a 4,000-pound vehicle. Computers are probably 10 times safer. Uh, we will not have humans driving cars within 20 years, I guarantee it. We're also thinking about food for cities, uh, in China, about 20% of the land is contaminated by heavy metals. We're depleting the, the aquifer. Uh, they're going to, in the Middle East, there are going to be huge problems related to water. Uh, food security is a big issue. This model of industrial food production really does not scale. Uh, so we're, we decided that there was nowhere on the planet, no school, thinking about food technology. There was good agricultural schools, good plant scientists, but we thought, well, MIT should be a good place to think about food tech. So Caleb, who's here with me also, is working on this project, which is how to grow food in new ways in cities near where it's consumed. So that's, the, that's hydroponics and aeroponics. We're not, we now are, are building a new laboratory to look at building integrated aeroponic and hydroponic food production using new sensor networks that can, where we can skin facades of buildings like this and serve markets, create jobs uh, directly in the city with great efficiencies. We think a one-story ray may have something like 100 times of the food production of growing in dirt with 90% less water, 60% less fertilizer. We have to prove that. We're also working on a new model for housing problem where the cities, those innovation cities where young people want to live uh, and work, uh, they're getting priced out of the market. Uh, this is Mayor Bloomberg from Manhattan, former mayor, standing in a little conventional micro apartment, 300 square feet that he was advocating that had a pull-out sofa bed and, a, and, a, and about three feet of closet space. Not, not a very livable model. So I challenged our students to design a space that had a big living room, a handicap accessible bathroom, a queen size bed, a full work desk, dining for six, and a full size kitchen. Uh, and, uh, and to put that in the smallest package we could fit it in. So this is about 19 square meters, or 200 square feet. Uh, and we were, with this, experimenting with transformation. So. We're using three types of interfaces. One is gesture, another is voice, and a third is touch. So, to, of course, to take a shower, you have to move the whole wall out of the way. Um, and um, we're having a lot of fun with this. We think we can make this work, actually. We think it can be cost effective because the cost of space is order of magnitude greater than the cost of this technology. And by the way, it can be really fun for young people. That's not the home I want, by the way, but that's, <laughs> that's what they want. This is, this is a work we did for a developer. You can see it's 300 square foot, same size as the Bloomberg apartment, 
with a big living room that converts to a big bedroom, which converts to a big dining room for 10 people, or this can be where your startup is. So we decided to test this. This is the graduate student that did the city car, now working on transformable, essentially architectural robotics for apartments. So table comes down from the ceiling. We've got that pretty well figured out. This is in his apartment with his wife, where the living room converts to a bedroom. <laughs> and we, we even actually have, we worked out the, this linen management system, so you don't have to make the bed, it just flips everything out of the way. <laughs> and uh, we're, uh, we actually have started a little startup to, to try to commercialize this kind of technology. Okay, and number five. Cultural events. I think this is a really critical urban intervention uh, to, um, particularly for these anonymous uh, new cities that are being built all over the world, you know, to enhance identity and expression and social ties. This is, uh, speaking of social ties, this is the work of Sandy Pentland, uh, who works with me at the Media Lab. He looks at uh, how broad is your network and how deep is your network? So these are, these are people in the workplace. So the bigger circles that with more connections are people with stronger social ties. The same thing is true in a city. And those are the people that are the most creative and the most productive. The outliers that without connections, those are non-productive, uh, disconnected people. And you can use technology to evaluate that. So um, I know there's a lot of Australian people in the room, so, yeah, Melbourne. So this is one of my favorite cities. And, and one of the reasons is because they, they, they didn't design for change. I think now we need to design for change. They just happened to take advantage of an opportunity to initiate change. They flipped the main streets with the cars and the people such that the people spaces are now the old service alleys that used to have dumpsters, the laneways of Melbourne, where, um, which are too narrow for cars. They're really... Uh, so the message is we need to design for people, not machines, and we need to design for change. Thank you. Kent, thank you very much for your presentation. So we have heard some absolutely wonderful presentations this afternoon, and I hope the thoughts that um, you have been left with will help to guide you in the next instalment of the policy discussions. I'm going to once again pass you over to a member of the Culture Summit team who will give further instructions about your movements uh, to the next venue and event. So thank you for your attention, thank you for your presentations, and I'll see you all later. Thank you.